you know, I figured it'd be a good idea to talk about this just because I started thinking about the two days. I started thinking about Halloween, and then I started thinking about Reformation Day, and I was like, you know, all these people are celebrating Reformation Day and how this is great and Baptists ought to celebrate this and all. And I'm sorry, I disagree. I don't think there's anything to celebrate for Baptists. I think it's a really scary story. That's what I think. I, 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 so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 16. And I'm going to give you a lot of information, a lot of history. And I've talked about the Reformers before, but I'm going to talk about them again. Yeah. But I, I, I want you to understand that I am being very polite. And I hope people like Paul Flynn. Is that his name, Paul Flynn? He did a video about me. He did. He did. He's got that accent, though. It makes him sound better than me just because he's got the accent. But anyway, he, I just want to listen to him because I just think of Jacob when I hear him. I don't know why. Like an Irishman. I don't know. No, actually, Jacob, you're not boring. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Well, he said I had a fictitious history. I'm like, wait a minute. I just took your history and used yours. All this is your resources. This is everything you guys brag about. This is what the reformers brag about. This is what they talk about. So I figure I'd give you a break tonight from feminism. <laughs> give you a break from that. By the way, I, it is pretty interesting, though. That feminism sermon has done the best out of any sermon probably in the last, I don't know, year maybe. It's crazy. Thanks. Uh, but <laughs> on to the... Scary day of Reformation Day. Let's pray, then we're going to get into this. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you uh, for rich heritage that starts with the apostles, Lord, and Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we thank you that we can actually talk about it and tell the truth about it and tell the truth that everyone wants to hide. Nobody wants to talk about the persecution, the Protestant persecution, the Reformation persecution of the Baptists, the Reformers and how they persecuted those that just simply believed the Bible. Help us now, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, John chapter 16, verse number 1. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, you may remember that I told you of them. You know, Jesus is talking to his apostles, and they were kicked out of the synagogues, but the principle still, still holds out. Many of these men were kicked out of churches. Many Baptists down through the centuries have been kicked out of churches, kicked out of towns, kicked out of community centers, kicked out of... Right? My neck vein, guys. Kick, <laughs> kicked... <laughs> And I, I have it. I actually have it. So it's a great picture. But, you know, they've been kicked out of a lot of places, countries, off boats, starved. So, you know, and then in the book of, and then in John, in John's epistles, John talks about what he says, no, and we know that no murder hath what? Eternal life. So we look at some of these persecutors of the Baptists and the Anabaptists, and they were murderers. And God said that they would do that. God said that there would come a time when they would do that. And Rome had already done it. So let me get started here. I want to read you some things. We all know that Halloween is about death. It's dark and gloomy, right? Well, if I tell you a few stories tonight that are very frightening, you'll understand. They may bring fear to your heart. They will quite possibly scare you more than Halloween ever could. There are stories of murder, child murder, death, starvation, destruction, annihilation of a people. I suppose you could say it was a dark and stormy night that started it all. Right? I have one. Well, maybe I didn't bring my V. Yeah, I usually have one. But it, it was a dark and stormy night that started it all. It was called it was, it was called that day, it was the day that, that Martin Luther I'm going to read you some of it. But listen, I want to tell you something that I think it's scarier than Halloween. I'm going to tell you why I think it's scarier than Halloween. Well, I'm going to show you. I'll illustrate. Let me keep going here. Let me keep going here. 
I'll tell you a story here tonight that led to murder and death. It's a side of the story that's not very popular that nobody wants to talk about, though. Nobody wants to talk about what really happened with the Reformation. So let's get started. What is Reformation Day? I'm going to read you from Wikipedia, okay? Reformation Day is a Protestant Christian religious holiday celebrated on October 31st alongside All Hallows' Eve during the tritium of All, All Hallow Tide in remembrance of the onset of the Reformation. Traditionally, October 31st, 1517 is widely held to be the day German monk Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses on the door of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Electorate of Saxony in the Holy Roman Empire. Historians and other experts on the subject argue that Luther may have chosen All Hallows' Eve on purpose to get the attention of common people, although this has never been proven. Available data suggests that October 31st was then Luther sent his work to Albert of Brandenburg, the Archbishop of Mons. This has been verified nowadays. It is regarded as the start of the Reformation alongside the unconfirmed nailing of the 95 theses to All Saints' church door on the same date. The holiday is a significant one both for Lutheran and Calvinist churches, although other Protestant communities also tend to commemorate this day. The Catholic Church recognizes it only recently and often sends its official representatives in ecumenical spirit to various commemoration events held by Protestants. Isn't that nice? How nice. Mama invites him back home. Isn't that wonderful? Like Kenneth Copeland said, the Reformation has ended. The protest is over. Well, I hate to break it to you, but Anabaptists were not invited to that table. Baptists were not at that table. Baptized believers were not at that table. They were never at that table. They were never, invi- they were never part of the Reformation. They became the prey of the Reformation. That's what happened to them. The Reformation really did nothing but soil much of Baptist doctrine, to be honest with you. The one thing I thank God for is the King James Bible that came out of the Reformation era. But I also know that where the manuscripts came from. We'll keep moving. It is lawful and officially recognized in some states of Germany and sovereign countries of Chile. In addition, countries like Switzerland and Austria provide special, specific in-laws pertaining to Protestant churches while not officially proclaiming it a nationwide holiday. So Luther nails his 95 theses on the door, and he was the man who kicked it off. He's the man that started it all, so to speak. Now, you would think that the story that I would tell you would be a great one. You would think this would be a great story, right? This is going to be great. For Bible believers everywhere, this would be great. Well, no, it really wouldn't. Because unless you borrow the history from Rome and you believe that churches actually derive their existence from the Roman Catholic Church, then you care about the Reformation. If not, the Reformation is like, I don't know, like Halloween. I don't care about it. I don't care about the Reformation Day. Why? Because it didn't have anything to do with Baptists besides abuse them, murder them, kill them, starve their children, throw them off cliffs, bury them drown them in water, give them a third baptism. That's a scary story. Wonder why they don't ever tell it. When's the last time you ever, hey, I got one for you. When's the last time you ever saw Lutherans come up and Lutherans and these other, and Protestants come up and say, you know what, we're sorry for what we did to the Anabaptists. We're sorry we drowned them. We admit that we killed you. When did the when did the Protestant when when did Ulrich Zwingli? When did they ever do that? When did Calvin ever renounce what he did? Never. That's why I'm never going to stop talking about it. Because they always try to hide it and they always try to shove it underneath and act like it didn't matter. It was okay to murder people because you disagreed with them. Because you were the one that was wrong because you don't know what baptism is. Even though you translate the word as dip. You translate the word as immerse and dip, but then you murder people who did. That's the truth. Is that a scary story? I think it is. I think it's scarier in Halloween. There ain't a witch scarier than that. You know, some say, why tell the story? Why not just let bygones be bygones? Why not just let it go? Well, the problem is they never repented of it. They've never admitted it. 
They continue to lie about it. They cover it up and act like it's no big deal. And they still continue on in their false doctrine of infant baptism, which is the badge of Antichrist, the badge of the whore. You know you have to do some strong spiritual and scriptural gymnastics to try to, to try to wiggle your way around and flip your way around the Bible to try to figure out some way of finding infant baptism. I mean, what a joke. Paul Flynn, when he tried to do it, what a joke. I hope he does hear this. I don't care. What a joke. What an absolute joke he was. You don't have one scripture for infant baptism. Not one. So go get baptized at a Baptist church and become a real preacher. There you go. That was free. You know, so I guess one of the first points I want to make to you, or the second point, however you want to look at it, is the real danger of this scary day is the costumes that they wore. See, what do you mean? Well, the real danger is the fact that just like Halloween, these people wore costumes too. See, they thought they did God's service to kill people who disagreed with them. So they dressed it up and wrapped it all up into a religious costume so they could kill people. Isn't that wonderful? That's what they did. Who did that? Well, the reformers did. You know, the ones that are all in the statues that stand up like this with their long beards and should say, I kill people on the top of their head. You know, the ones that made fun of the Baptists when they were drowning them, when they gave them their third baptism and laughed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those. So they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. They actually were so demented, they actually thought they were doing God's service by killing the people of God. Do you know how many people don't ever talk about this? I never, you go to Baptist pages all over the place. And you know what? I respect a lot of what J.D. Hall says, but you know what? He whitewashes the persecution that Baptists went through. Why be a Baptist then? Why whitewash it? Why are you whitewashing what they did? Because you want to get along with them? I want them to repent. I want them to admit that their infant baptism is a badge of hell and it shouldn't be worn and they should repent of it. I'm not going to yoke up with people that believe a false doctrine like that, a damnable heresy that came from their mama Rome. 1 Peter chapter 2. Verse number 16, you know, they have a cloak. That's their costume. They wore a cloak. It says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. You know, they have a disguise or a costume that they cloak themselves in. It's religious attire. That's what they did. That's what the reformers did. They cloaked themselves in religious attire so they could murder people. That disagreed with them. First Samuel chapter 28, verse number 8, And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit, and bring him up whom I shall name unto thee. Why did he do that? He cloaked, he disguised himself. But Saul was religious, right? They're always religious. Don't you understand? The Antichrist is going to be religious. They're always religious. They're not going to, the danger is not when they come in it's the danger is, is when they come as ministers of righteousness. That's the danger. That's the costume they wore. That's the costume the reformers wore when they murdered our Baptist forefathers. They came in a costume. They came in religious garb. Calvin had his, his, uh, his robe, right? His phylacteries, yeah, his robe with his... That's right. That's what he had. They came as Christians, as upstanding people that fought Rome, but then they murdered a group of people that disagreed with them that were more righteous than they were. You know why they hated Menno Simmons? You want to know why they hated him? They hated Menno Simmons because he said that their preachers, and they admitted that their preachers were just as wicked as Roman Catholic preachers. And Menno Simmons was like, you guys are wicked. You're going to hell. That's what Menno Simmons said. He said, you're going to hell, man. Oh, man, I got his works back there. You read some of his things, and he said, he's like, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're all wicked. You're a bunch of liars. You're a bunch of fakes. You're going to hell. They were drinking. They were boozing it up. They were partying. They were doing everything. Mm -hmm. Those that followed the New Testament, those that believed the Bible, and those that stood for the ordinances as they were once given unto the saints, those that earnestly contended for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints, they were murdered for it. 
How else did they cloak it? They cloaked it in what they called the solas. I like this is my favorite one right here. This is my favorite cloak that they wore. They called it sola scriptura, right? Is that how you say that? Scriptura, or is that, is that right? I don't speak Latin. Okay. I don't even speak English. I don't know what I speak. It means Bible only, right? Right? Isn't that what it means? Wait a minute. Now stop. Hold on. Hang on a second. Now, how did they have something called sola scriptura, and they didn't even believe the Bible about baptism? How can you how can you see something right there in front of you and say we stand for sola? But the Baptist took the Bible and showed you all of them. Hey, I can show you. I can show you John Clark's treaties against infant baptism. I can show you all of the Baptists, the Anabaptists, all of them. Uh, the Swedish Baptist guy. I forgot his name. I have his book. Joshua bought for me. What's the name? Uh, Andrew. Weiberg, thank you. Andrew Weiberg wrote his book, and they tried to run, run those guys out of town, right? Like, they always run us out of town. They try anyway. But he wrote a book on it, too. All of them wrote books on it that were straightforward from the Scriptures, and, they have, and the others have no Scriptures. They, they have no Scriptures for infant baptism. There are no Scriptures. Show me one baby that was baptized in the Bible. Has anybody ever seen one baby that was baptized in the Bible? One. No. So then why would you kill for that doctrine? Can I ask you a question? If you can't find one baby baptized in the Bible, why would you kill somebody for that? I'll tell you why, because you're antichrist, that's why. You're the little antichrist devil cloaked in a religious garb. That's exactly what you are. So anyway, they, they hid under sola scripture. It should have been called sola church fathers, right? Or Sola Origin or Sola Augustine. Right? Sola Gay Eunuch, whatever he was. That was Origin, wasn't it? Sola Gay Eunuch Boy. That's what you could have called him. That's what he was. He was like a gay eunuch. I'm sorry. He's like a creep. Sola Gay Eunica. That's what you could have called him. <laughs> He's looking at me like, what are you, nuts? No, I'm not. It's the truth. That's who they followed. Hey, I, hey, if you listen to the Baptist Battle for Liberty, you hear a lot of things from history that are like, whoa, where'd that come from? Like, what was that one ceremony of the ass and the... <laughs> and the, Yeah, they brought him up in front. That was actually in... Yeah. Anyway. And Sola de Gloria. This means only worship God. Sola Fida, faith only. I think I said that right. Grace only. Christ only. But they didn't really believe the Bible was their only rule of faith and practice because they followed who? They, they admitted that they translated the word. Luther's own translation meant to dip, to immerse. Luther's own translation. So I want you to think about that. That's how they cloaked it, though, as we're standing against Rome. And we're saying, wait a minute, but you're, you killed those guys because... They didn't baptize babies, and you can't find one baby baptized in the Bible. Not one. Paul Flynn, not one. Not even one. Well, that's something to kill somebody for. You know, Reformation Day was hell on earth for the Baptists and the Anabaptists. These poor men and women and children are described in the hero chapter. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 36, please. Bible says, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, in mountains, the Waldensians, and in dens and caves of the earth. Why were they, they were hiding, trying to live. 
Could you imagine holding a church service in the cave? Who's been, Jessica, you've been to the Waldensian Trail of Faith. You've been there. Who's been to that Waldensian Trail of Faith? Anybody? Yeah, we've been there. Um, yeah, you need to go. That's, you need to go. Anyway, if you get into that cave, um, you didn't get to go to the tour, though. We had a tour guide, but you went to everything, Hannah. But we did, you, when we went in January, it was, it was cold. Oh, no, we went back there in June. That's right. I forgot. I've been there twice this year. Oh, okay. I forgot about that. I'm getting old. Um, but when we went there, you could see just a little light that comes through the top of that cave. That was for the preacher that held his Bible there. They had to keep it in the dark so they didn't see him. And they had to be quiet. So when they sang, they just sang. And if they were heard, they would die. They wandered in caves of the earth. In deserts and in mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. So I'm going to read you about some of the scary things that happened to them. These poor baptized believers were persecuted by all the reformers. All of them. Zwingli in Zurich, Switzerland, was a persecutor before adopting Baptist principles. Anabaptist leaders Conrad Grebel, Felix Mons, and, G and George were associated with Zwingli in the beginning of his work in Zurich. Unlike Zwingli, they moved beyond Protestantism and state churchism to a true New Testament faith and practice. By the end of 1524, Grebel and Mons had taken a position against infant baptism, and that's a death warrant. If the Protestants or the Catholics ruled anywhere around, if, if, you, if you took a stance on, against infant baptism, you're going to die. You're going to lose your head. And believe me, they'd do it now, too, if those little, if those little devils get away with it. Mm-hmm. That's why they do snicker and laugh at you when you talk about it. They don't like us. Yep. Anyway, they wanted to establish a true church composed only of regenerate bapti baptized members with a simple Lord's Supper as a memorial meal. Does that sound familiar? It's called the New Testament Church, right? On January 17, 1525, a, di a, dis a dispute between Zwingli and those opposed to infant baptism was conducted in Zurich before the city council. The decision was not long in coming. The next day, January 18th, the council decreed that all infants must be baptized within eight days of birth, and those who did not baptize their infants would be banished from the city. Another decree on January 21st forbade all opponents of infant baptism to meet together or to speak in public. So you couldn't do what we're doing right now, and you couldn't go out and street preach. If they found you out street preaching, you're going to get it. Just like they did to John Clark and Ovidiah Holmes. Ah, they don't like talking about that, though. See, isn't that scarier than Halloween? I think it is. I think it's much scarier than Halloween. Yeah. The day of the first city council proclamation, Grebel, Mons, and others of the like mind met together in defiance of the decree, but in obedience to the word of God and determined to form a church based upon biblical principles as they saw them at that point. K. Jacob was first uh, baptized by Grebel. Upon confession of his faith in Christ, he turned baptized the others. The baptism was by pouring, by they left the but they later adopted immersion within a week. 35 more were baptized. March of that year, the swingly influenced city council issued a strong edict against the Anabaptists, which ratified in November. You know without a doubt and have heard from many that for a long time some peculiar men who imagine that they are learned, they always insult our intelligence. It's the first thing they got to do. They got the supposed IFB history. The supposed IFB history. What is that attack on? Oh, your intelligence and you, oh, you're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, right. Right. Have come forward, some peculiar, who imagine that they are learned, have come forward astonishingly and without any evidence of the Holy Scriptures. That's a lie. That's a lie. Given as a pretext by simple and pious men, have preached and without permission and consent of the church, have proclaimed that the that infant baptism did not proceed from God but from the devil. I agree. Amen. And therefore ought not to be practiced. I agree. Amen. We therefore ordain and require that hereafter all men, women, boys, and girls forsake rebaptism and shall not make use of it. 
hereafter and shall let infants be baptized. Whoever shall, whoever shall act contrary to this public edict shall be fined for every offense, one mark. And if any be disobedient and stubborn, they shall be treated with severity. For the obedient we will protect... The disobedient we will punish according to his deserts without fail. By this all are to conduct themselves. All this we confirm by this public, do public document stamped with the seal of our city and given on St. Andrew's Day, A.D. 1525. Yeah. The Anabaptists and their leaders, including Grebel and Mons, were thrown into prison. That's another thing they do to them. Throw them in jail. In December 1527, Felix Mons and Henry Riemann were put to death by drowning. Okay, stop. Can I ask you why, the, why, do you, why, did, why did these good, upstanding Reformation Day reformers, these wonderful, Christian, godly people, take a man and drown him? What were they doing? They're mocking the ordinance of baptism. So they drowned him. Literally, they just drowned him. Now, that's scary. That's scarier than any werewolf or vampire that's a loser by day. That's some scary, man, I, that's some scary stuff. The Baptists were delivered to the executioner. What, check, the council had decreed or, and said this, he who immerses shall be immersed. You know what they're talking about? Drowned. The Baptists were delivered to the executioner who bound their hands, placed them in a boat, and threw them into the water. Some Protestants mockingly called this the third baptism. Mm -hmm. The third baptism. Now, let me ask you a question. It is like the Third Reich, yes. Uh-huh. They bound their hands and placed them in a boat and threw them in the water. So these people believe in the same, supposedly, these people believe in the same God you do. They believe in the same Jesus Christ you do. They believe in salvation by grace through faith alone. And you're killing them because they don't baptize babies, which you can't find one baby baptized in the Bible. Not one. So you killed somebody for that. The Baptist martyr Felix Mons was a very learned man, skilled in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. As he let, was led th through Zurich to the boat, he praised God that he was going to die for the truth of the word of God. His old mother and faithful brother exhorted him to be steadfast unto death. After declaring, in thy hands, Lord, I commend my spirit, he was cruelly drowned. Protestant leader Henry Bullinger in Geneva, wrote an account of Manz's execution and supported it. Mm -hmm. Another Baptist that was tormented by those influenced in, in Zwingli, Zurich, was Hubmeyer. He was a very learned man and had been a close friend with Zwingli in early days. And they had fought together against Roman Catholicism, but Hubmeyer desired to follow the Bible in all manners, and he rejected infant baptism and became a Baptist. He wrote powerful books in defense of his faith, and one was in defense of believers' baptism. He said, the command is to baptize those who believe. To baptize those who do not believe, therefore, is forbidden. He was right. He also wrote one against persecution titled, Concerning Heretics and Those That Burn Them. He taught that it is not the will of Jesus Christ to put men to death for their beliefs, that the churches are in the business of saving men, not burning them. What happened to the disciples when they were coming out of Samaria? Lord, they rejected Christ and they did not receive him. And what did they say? Lord, shall we now call down fire from heaven and burn these up? And what did he say? You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. He said that Christ came to save men's lives, not to destroy them. Amen? They learned this from their mom at Rome. <laughs> I've already thought about a sermon title for that.
He was thrown into prison by the Zurich Protestants in January 1526 and kept there for four months. His appeal to his old friend Zwingli was ignored. Nice guy. He was, his wife also was in prison and his health was broken. He had just gotten over a sickness that was almost unto death. In this sad and discouraged condition, he was tortured on the rack by the Protestant authorities, and on April 6, 1526, the broken man agreed to recant his beliefs. The people of Zurich were summoned to the cathedral to hear the recantation of this well-known Baptist preacher. Zwingli first preached a sermon against the heretics. Oh, man, so hard. You know, <laughs> this is, this is, these men truly did believe in loving their enemies. And waiting for God to avenge, uh, to avenge them. They really did. They had to. Zwingli first preached a sermon against the heretics. Then every eye turned to Hubmeyer, who went forward to read the recantation. As he began to do so in a trembling voice, he broke down weeping. As he swayed to and fro in agony, he was suddenly strengthened by the Lord, and he shouted, Infant baptism is not of God, and men must be baptized by faith in Christ. Pandemonium broke out. Some screamed against him while others shouted applause. The Zurich authorities quickly took him back to the dungeon. There he wrote these blessed words of prayer to God. O oh, immortal God, this is my faith. I confess it with heart and mouth, and I have testified it publicly before the church in baptism. I faithfully pray thee, graciously keep me in it until my end. And should I be forced from it out of mortal fear and timidity, by tyranny, torture, sword, fire, or water, I now appeal to thee, O oh, my compassionate Father. Raise me up again by thy grace of thy Holy Spirit, and suffer me not to depart without this faith. This I pray thee from the bottom of my heart, through Jesus Christ, thy most beloved Son, our Lord and Savior. Father, in thee do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. That prayer was answered because Hubmeyer went on for the Lord and was faithful until death. After he was allowed to leave Zurich, he moved to Moravia, where he had a very fruitful ministry and harvest of souls were brought to the Lord. On March 10th, 1528 in Vienna, he was burned to death at the stake and he died in the faith that he preached. His faithful Christian wife was drowned eight days later. You know, it kind of seems, it kind of makes the trials of this life seem a little minimal, doesn't it? When you think about that. I think about a lot of haters out there, and all they can do is run their mouth. They can't really hurt me. Right? Not in that way, anyway. Mm. About that time, Zwingli wrote a vicious book against the Anabaptists called a, a Refutation of the Tricks of Catabaptists or Drowners. He called Anabaptists wild asses. in other insulting terms, and said their immersions were from hell and that the Anabaptists themselves would go to hell. This makes me really want to meet that guy. <laughs> like, if he was alive right now, I'd like be like, I'd like to talk to that guy. He was a reformer, wasn't he? So Zwingli, he was one of the fathers, right, of the Reformation. Everybody loves Zwingli. Bob Jones University, I've told you this before, takes tours over there and shows people, here's Ulrich Zwingli. Other Baptists, well, they're not Baptists. But, uh, but Baptists take, take people over there on tours, and here's all these Baptist kids that are standing there looking up at this statue at Ulrich Zwingli, and they're lauding it. Oh, this great reformer. Meanwhile, they're standing down here below and etched in the stone is a memorial to the Anabaptists that were drowned. They don't even, they're stepping on their own heritage to lift up a Protestant reformer. One that drowned their forefathers and the children and the babies because they're evil. Narrow is the way. How about Luther? Luther. It's important to understand that Luther changed his position in many important ways. In the early days of his Reformation, for example, Luther taught that the proper mode of baptism was immersion. He changed in regard to baptism. In his German New Testament, he translated baptize as dip, which is a good translation, and that term means to put into water and to take out of the water. The term immersion, on the other hand, does not have the connotation of taking out of the water. 
whatever he means by that. In 1518, he taught not only that the word baptize means to immerse, but that the significance of the ordinance points to immersion. That also, that signification of baptism demands, for it signifies that the old man and sinful birth from the flesh and blood shall be completely drowned through the grace of God. Therefore, a man should sufficiently perform the significance the significant and right perfect sign. The sign rests in this, that a man plunge in a person in the water in the name of the Father, but does not leave, etc., Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, but does not leave him therein, but lifts him out again. Therefore, it is called being lifted out of the font or the depths. And so must all bo- of both of these things be the sign, the dipping and the lifting out. Thirdly, the, sig- the significant is the saving death of the sins and of the resurrection of the grace of God. The baptism is the bath of the new birth, also a drowning of the sins in the baptism. So he's talking about the picture of that. I don't know what Luther exactly meant by that because I don't trust Luther. But I will say this, and I, I want to leave this as a point of reference. Eric John Phelps, which I don't agree with on a lot of things, but he did write Vatican Assassins, so we do agree on quite a bit of things But from that standpoint. But he wrote Vatican Assassins. He maintains that the Jesuits got into uh, Concordia University, or Augsburg University, and changed Luther's writings after his death. He says that Luther's writings were tainted and perverted after his death, that there are some things that Luther is accused of that he never did. Or that he never was for. But so I don't, I can't say that I know that for a fact. I don't believe that. Um, Just because Eric John Phelps leans towards the reformers more than what I would. And there's no proof of that. I've never seen any proof of that. You can speculate and say that, but if there's no proof of it, then there's no proof of it. And there is no proof that ever happened. But Luther, he sounds like a Baptist there. But at the same time, he defended the unscriptural practice of baptizing infants. And as soon as he gave up the debate on baptism, he became became an enemy of the Anabaptists. As soon as he wasn't willing to go farther in the truth, he started killing them. Luther also changed in regard to persecution and bloodshed. This part we know. Early on in his Reformation career, Luther did not support the death sentence against false teachers, though he supported their persecution short of death and their banishment. Though naturally of a very warm and violent temper, he was averse to punishing heretics with death. He says in his writings, I am very averse to the shedding of blood, even in the case of such as deserve it. I dread it the more because of the papists and the Jews, under this pretense, have destroyed holy prophets and innocent men. So I am afraid the same would happen amongst ourselves. It did happen. If in one single instance it should be allowed to be lawful to put seducers to death, I can therefore by no means consent that false teachers should be destroyed. But as to all other punishments, he seems to think they may lawfully be employed. For after the above passage, he adds, it is sufficient that they should be banished. Agreeably to these principles, he persuaded the electors of Saxony not to tolerate in their dominions the followers of Zwinglius in their opinion of the sacrament, nor to enter into any terms of union with them for their common defense against the attempts of the Catholics to destroy them. He also wrote to Albert, Duke of Prussia, to persuade him to banish them from his territories. The History of the Inquisition, J.J. Stockdale. Luther changed dramatically later on. He supported the utter destruction of the revolting peasants. But when the peasants of Germany tried to apply this liberty to themselves by overthrowing the tyrannical lords and gaining their independence, Luther raged against them. He said the peasants would not listen. They would not let anyone tell them anything. Their ears must be unbuttoned with bullets till their heads jump off their shoulders. On the obstinate, hardened, blinded peasants, let no one have mercy, but let everyone as he is able hew, stab, slay, lay about him as though among mad dogs, so that peace and safety may be maintained. Martin Luther, Erlingen Edition, Volume 24, page 294, Volume 15, page 276. Luther's writings on the peasant wars are full of such expressions as the above. When he was in his latter years, it reproached when he was in his latter years, reproach for such violent language and for inciting territorial lords to mercilessly slaughter them, they killed over 100,000 peasants. He answered defiantly, It was I, Martin Luther, who slew all the peasants in the insurrection, for I commanded them to be slaughtered. All their blood is upon my shoulders. 
but I cast it on our Lord God who commanded me to speak in this way. Uh huh. See, you got to understand that it's important to understand this history. It's very important that you learn it, that you know it. Because you know what the average fundamental Baptist does? He goes to church and asks any of those people why they're a Baptist, and they can't tell you. They can't tell you the history. They don't know the persecution. They don't know what Baptists went through. They don't have any idea about Baptist history. They know a fundamentalist history that starts with the fundamentals of the faith, that starts out of the, out of the um, fundamentalist movement, which was 1903, I believe, a Presbyterian movement that started to fight against the Southern Baptist uh, infiltration of the Southern Baptist churches and the seminaries from German rationalism. That's where it started, and that's where they think their history started. Started. So then Witsit came in with his theory in the late 1860s, 50s, 50s or 60s. I'm going to talk about that, devil. Uh, Witsit's theory, he brought in that Baptists originated from the Reformation. So J.T. Christian traveled the world proving that Baptists did not originate from the Reformation, but they were before the Reformation. I don't recommend starting your reading of Baptist history with J.T. Christian's two-volume set, but I do believe everybody should own it. If you try to read J.T. Christian's two-volume set, it is very lengthy, it has a lot of resources, and it might be a little too much for you to start out with. Some people can handle it, some people can't, depends. But it's a resource. It's a vast resource. I recommend you start out reading American Crimson Red for Baptist history, for America. That way you get a good understanding. Okay, so Luther... He said, but I cast it on our Lord God who commands me to speak in this way. God never commanded you to kill people. There's no command in the scriptures that God commands you to kill people. Luther also turned against the Anabaptist he had once sympathized with. Sadder yet, late Luther reacted with equal violence to the Anabaptists who tried to apply the principle of liberty themselves. Whatever happened to Sola Scriptura? Right? The Bible alone, what What happened? All they did was take the Bible alone. Who tried to apply the principle of liberty themselves, though he knew there were, they were both, there were both non-resistant and harmless Anabaptists as well as radical ones of social revolutionaries. He condemned altogether, favoring a policy of extermination. Well, Germany, some say that Hitler was the revenge on Germany uh, for the Protestant Reformation, but I think maybe it was their persecution of God's people. That's what I think. That's what I think, but... Anyway, Luther also, so he turned against them. In 1529, the imposing Diet of Spears pronounced the death sentence upon all Anabaptists. The council was composed of both Roman Catholic and Protestant princes and heads of state. They hated each other and did not get along, even in this diet, but they hated the Anabaptists even more. Do you understand that? Rome and the Protestants hate us more than they hate each other. Now, I've seen some people like that before. I met people that went to church here, and I'm going to tell you what they hated each other, but they end up hating me more than they hated each other. I ain't kidding you either. And we see that in the Bible, right? Herod and Pontius Pilate. They became friends by hating Jesus. Right? I've seen that before. I've seen on the street, too, two people can hate each other. By the time they're done, they'll hate you more than they hate each other, and they'll all turn against you. Seen that many times. Yeah. The proclamation of the Diet greatly accelerated the program of extermination already in progress. 400 special police were hired to hunt down Anabaptists and execute them on the spot. The group proved too small and was increased to 1,000. Thousands of Anabaptists fell victim to one of the most widely spread persecutions in Christian history. Burning faggots and smoldering stakes marked their trek across Europe. You'd find their heads on poles, lit on fire. Mm -hmm. What's that? Yeah, well, I don't, yeah, it was, it was after him, I think. It came after him, from what I understand. It was his followers. In 1538, the Lutheran elector of Hesse, 
Hesse in Germany, wrote to King Henry VIII of England and urged him to persecute the Anabaptists. He testified, there are no rulers in Germany, whether they be papists or professor of the doctrines of the gospel, the Protestants, professors of the doctrines of the gospel, to do suffer these men if they do come into their hands. All men punish them quickly. We use a just moderation, which God requireth of all good rulers. If any do stubbornly defend the ungodly and wicked errors of that sect, yielding nothing to such as can do to teach them truly, these are kept a good space in prison and sometimes sore punished there. Yet in, in such short are they handled that death is long deferred for hope of amendment, and as long as any hope is favor is showed to life. If there be no hope left, then the obstinate are put to death. Evans, the early English Baptist, chapter 2. That was called Protestant moderation. So if they show some hope, we'll just keep them alive in prison for many years and torture them there every day. Yeah, it is Catholic. Historian J.T. Christian observes that Calvin was responsible in a large measure for the demon of hate and fierce hostility which the Baptists of England had to encounter. Calvin enforced Christian doctrine and principles at the point of the sword. In October 1563, the Geneva government burned to death Michael Servetus for heresy. Servetus held Unitarian views and was definitely a false teacher, but the New Testament nowhere instructs the churches to kill false teachers. Servetus' death sentence was supported not only by Calvin, but also by Melan Melancothan. I always say his name wrong. Who cares? He's a murderer. In Germany and Bullinger. In Geneva. And by other Protestant leaders who were consulted about the case. So they all talked. Yeah, let's all kill him. Other men were also put to death under Calvin's tenor. So entirely was he in favor of persecuting measures that he wrote a treatise in defense of them, maintaining the lawfulness of putting heretics to death. And he reduced those rigid theories to practice in his conduct towards Castilio. Oh, I remember that. Remember that? He, he was the guy that left a note on his <laughs> pulpit. <laughs> Well, that wasn't a good idea. <laughs> Jerome Bolsey and Servetus, whose fates are too generally known to require being here repeated. At the Council of Geneva in 1632, Nicholas Anton was condemned to be the first hanged and then burned for opposing the doctrine of the Trinity. The history of the Inquisition. In the days of King Edward VI of England, Calvin wrote a letter to Lord Protector Somerset and urged him to put Anabaptists to death. He said this, These altogether deserve to be well punished by the sword, seeing that they do conspire against God, who had set him in his royal seat. John Christian, A History of the Baptist. They deserve to die for that. Though Elizabeth, the next one is Elizabeth, though Elizabeth gave freedom to Protestants and treated Catholics leniently, even though they continually plotted against her throne and even her life, she treated the Baptist severely. Why do those... Poor Baptists always get treated that way. Because it's a narrow way, that's why. Baptists had increased in England and were scattered in many parts of the country. Langley and his English Baptists before 1602 mentions churches in nine countries that trace their origin to the days between 1576 and 1600. These had grown up from the native preaching that had been going on for a long time. They also began to emigrate from Holland, from France, and other places, hoping that the Protestant queen in England would grant them more liberty than existed in their home countries. Encouraged by the bishops of the Church of England, within months of coming to the throne, Elizabeth issued a proclamation that Anabaptists should be located and transported out of England. If they did not leave, they would be punished. She said the Anabaptists were infected with dangerous opinions. They just believed the Bible. On February 4, 1559, the High Commission Court was established by Parliament. The Queen issued an injunction against the preaching of any doctrine contrary to the Church of England. She forbade the printing of any heretical book. She also set up royal visitations whereby representatives of the Crown were to go throughout the country and circuit with the power to search out all heretics. Yes, she was a Jezebel. Yep. And, you know, what she did was she set them all out that she... Instituted home visits. Sound familiar? Yeah, so they kicked their doors in and said, are you a heretic? Oh, you are? Well, here you go. You know why that don't happen in America yet? No, you know why that don't happen in America yet? Because there were some Baptists, there were some Baptists, right? That stood against 
that stood against the Church of England and stood against the Anglicans and stood against all of them and that, that, that pushed for a Bill of Rights. You don't think a Presbyterian for that. You think a Baptist for that. A lot of them, yeah. All right, by the end of 1559, the Act for the Uniformity of Religion was put into effect. It made the doctrine and practice of the Church of England the law of the land. In June 1575, two Dutch Anabaptists were burned to death at Smithfield. Eleven had originally been condemned to burn after a trial in the consistory of St. Paul's Cathedral, but nine were banished instead. One of those who were burned was Hendrik Turkwoogt. He was a young man, about 25, who had been married only a few weeks. He had fled to England to escape persecution in Fleming, thinking that the Protestant Queen Elizabeth would be merciful. The other man was, was Jan Peters, was an older man with a wife and nine children dependent on his labors. His first wife had been martyred in Flanders, and his current wife was the widow of a martyr. Now she was made a widow of a martyr the second time. The death warrants for these two men by the Protestant Queen were almost exactly the same as those issued by Catholic Queen Mary. The queen would not relent. On the 15th of July, she signed the warrant for the execution of two of them, commanding the sheriffs of London to burn them alive in Smithfield. A copy of the warrant is now before me. There is also before me a copy of the warrant for the burning of the Archbishop Cranmer in Queen Mary's days. These warrants are substantially alike. In fact, they are almost couched in the same language, word for word. Mary the Papist dooming to death the Protestant and Elizabeth the Protestant ordering the execution of the Baptist. Advance the same pretensions and adopt the same forms of speech. Both of these call their victims heretics. Both assume to be zealous for justice. Both are defenders of the Catholic faith. Both declare their determination to maintain and defend the Holy Church per liberties, per rights and liberties. Both avow their resolve to root out and ex exterminate heresies and errors. Both assert that the heretics named in the warrants had been convicted and condemned according to the laws and the customs of the realm. Both charge the sheriffs to take their prisoners to a public and open place and there to commit them to the fire in the presence of the people and cause them to be really consumed in the said fire. Both warn the sheriffs that if they fail, they're in at their own peril. The queen had no excuse for claiming that these two men were dangerous to her throne. They had submitted to her following the statement of faith. Listen, here's their statement of faith. They were in no danger to her. We believe and confess the magistrates are set and ordained of God to punish the evil and protect the good, which magistry we desire from our hearts to obey, as it is written in 1 Peter 2.13, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, for he beareth not the sword in vain, Romans 13.4. And Paul teaches us that we should offer up for all prayers and intercessions and giving of thanks, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires that all men should be saved. He further teaches us to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, and to be ready to every good work. Therefore we pray, your majesty, kindly to understand or write our meaning, which is that we do not despise the eminent, noble, and gracious queen and her wise counsels, but esteem them as worthy of all honor, to whom we desire to be obedient in all things that we may. For we confess with Paul as above that she is God's servant, and that if we resist this power, we resist the ordinance of God. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Therefore, we confess to be due unto her and are ready to give tribute, custom, honor, and fear as Christ himself has taught us, saying, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Since, therefore, she is a servant of God, we will kindly pray, pray her majesty that it would please her to show pity to us poor prisoners, even as our Father in heaven is pitiful. We likewise do not approve of those who resist the magistrates, but confess and declare with our whole heart that we must be obedient and subject unto them as we have here set down. Did that sound like a disruptor of the kingdom? Their statement of faith included obedience to magistrates very thoroughly. Right, right. And what did she do? She killed them anyway. See, that's scarier than Halloween. Baptists were persecuted under the days of King James. When Elizabeth died... James I ascended to the throne of England. He was the king who authorized the translation of that masterpiece of English scripture, the King James Bible, which appeared in 1611. He also persecuted Baptists with a passion. They were imprisoned, their goods confiscated, and one was burned. The last man burned alive in England for his religion was Edward Whiteman, a Baptist in Smithfield on April 11, 1612, under James. A month earlier, Bartholomew Legate had also been burned. It is said that he was an Arian, meaning that he denied the deity of Christ. A wide variety of heresies were charged against Whitman, 
But as Thomas Crosby, author of the History of the English Baptist, observes, many of the heresies they charge upon him are so foolish and inconsistent that it very much discredits what they say. If he really held such opinions, he must either be an idiot or a madman, and ought rather to have had their prayers and assistance than be put to such a cruel death. Three of the articles upon which Whiteman was burned are these, that the baptizing of infants is an abominable custom. Well, I agree with that. That the Lord's Supper and baptism are not to be celebrated as they are now practiced in the Church of England. I agree with that. That Christianity is not wholly professed and preached in the Church of England, but only in part. And I agree with that. On these three articles, I take my stand with the old Baptist martyr. It is an interesting fact that both the first and the last martyr burned in England for religion were Baptist. The first, the first who was put to his cruel death in England was William Sawtree, supposed upon very probable grounds to have denied infant baptism. And this man, the last who was honored with this kind of martyrdom, was expressly condemned for that opinion, so that this sect had the honor both of leading the way and bringing up the rear of all the martyrs who were burnt alive in England. See why they hate the trail of blood? Because their feet are in it. Their feet are bloody. Others died during the reign of James I, but not by burning. They died in prison. This was not because of the kindness of the king, but because of the outcry of the people against burnings. Historian Thomas Fuller notes, King James politically preferred that heretics hereafter should, though condemned, should silently and privately waste themselves away in the prison. Rather than to grace them and amuse others with the solemnity of the public execution, which in popular judgment usurped the honor of the persecution. Thomas Crosby agrees. King James chose, therefore, for the future only to seize their estates and waste away their lives privately in nasty prisons rather than honor them with such a public martyrdom, which would unavoidably go under the name of persecution. So he hid his persecution and threw him in jail. That's why I don't laud King James for anything. It's not his Bible. It's not his Bible. He just authorized it. And God, God used Nebuchadnezzar, and he was a wicked man, too. And God used Cyrus, and God used all these other kings, and they were wicked men, but God still used them. Because where the word of a king is, where the, where there's power, the Bible says, right? So God used it. Just like God's going to use all these magistrates and congressmen and governors and presidents and other people, he uses them the way he wants them, when he's done with them. That's what God does with them. In 1615, the Baptists petitioned King James for freedom of religion. They stated their doctrine plainly and proof of Scripture that it is not the will of Christ that Christians persecute those who have different beliefs. This too was rejection, rejected. Joseph, Joseph Envy observes that the Baptists suffered severely from 1590 to 1630. Following is a description written by a Baptist prisoner. Listen to this. Our miseries are long and lingering imprisonments for many years in diverse countries, counties of England in which many have died and left behind them widows and many small children, taking away our goods and others the like, of which we can make good probation, not for any disloyalty to your majesty nor hurt to any mortal man, our adversaries themselves being judges, but only because we dare not assent unto the practice in, in the worship of God, such things as we have not faith in, because it is a sin against the Most High, from a tract a most humble supplication of many of the king's majesties, loyal subjects, ready to testify all civil obedience by the oath of allegiance or otherwise, and that of conscience who are persecuted only for differing in religion, contrary to divine and human testimonies. The cruel attitude of many Anglican ministers towards Baptists was exemplified in 1644 with the publication, The Dippers Dipped. Or the Anabaptists ducked and plunged over head and ears at a disputation at Southwark. I know, it's hard not to get angry. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> oh, boy. Especially when they still give you that smug look when they talk to you. They still have that smug reformer look on their face. Like, I want to drown you. They still have that look. They haven't changed their doctrine. Do you understand that? They, they cannot do it because they don't have power here. They lost that power with the First Amendment, with the Bill of Rights. They could no longer do that. But those 40 imprisoned Baptist pastors over in Virginia, they were part of the reason why that happened. They sat in prison. They suffered. Obadiah Holmes was beaten. 
These men, they were banished. Their guns were stolen. Indians killed them. Their kids were murdered because they had no weapons to protect themselves. It would happen today if they could get away with it. Influential Anglican author Daniel Featley described the Anabaptists in Vienna being tied together in chains and drowned in the river. He then observes callously, here you see the hand of God in punishing these sectaries some way answerable to their sin. What was their sin? They believed the Bible concerning baptism. There is no baptism that is done before someone believes. It's not in there. It's not in there. They went on to say this, of all heretics and schismatics, the Anabaptists ought to be most carefully looked into and severely punished, but not utterly exterminated and banished out of the church and kingdom. They preach and print and practice their heretical impieties openly. They hold their conventicles weekly in our chief cities and suburbs thereof, and their prophecy by turns. They flock in great multitudes to their Jordans, and both sexes enter into the river and are dipped after their manner with a kind of spell. containing the heads of their erroneous tenants. And as they defile our rivers with their impure washings and our pulpits with their false prophecies and fanatical enthusiasm, so the oppresses sweat and groan under the load of their blasphemies. What a load of garbage. So, you see, oh, you, did you hear what they were accusing them of? Did you catch that? No. You didn't catch it? Oh, listen, this is rich. Pay attention closely. They said they had them under a spell. You mean like mind control? Oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a familiar thing. I've, I've heard that before. Mm-hmm. Then we move to America here, and we're almost done. Massachusetts was founded by the colony of Pilgrims in Plymouth in 1620 and by the Puritans of the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1630. Those people are mean. Anyway, the pilgrims were separatists who had been forced to flee the persecution of the Church of England. They had spent a brief time in the Netherlands, then traveled by ship to America. While in the Netherlands, they enjoyed some measure of religious liberty, but they did not grant the same to others. They practiced infant baptism and denounced Anabaptists. The Puritans were Anglicans who desired some reformation of the Church of England, but who did not separate from it. They brought from England the false concept of a state church and a persecuting spirit that they got from their mama whore Rome. That wasn't in there. I added that. I just, you know, I I actually want to do a sermon, I mean, a Baptist battle for liberty, and I want to put, like, Rome up there, Rome and the Reformers, and put, like, Yo Mama. And I I just want to put that up there, and I just want to, I want to, I do. I might. Yeah, that would be funny. Yeah. Josh, I heard you say that. That's, 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 is it you that said that? <laughs> yeah, that would. <laughs> yeah, that would be, and it's all true. So, following are some examples of the Protestant persecutions in the early history of Massachusetts before the formation of the American Union. Roger Williams, we know him, was banished from Massachusetts, 1635. A learned and zealous man who could read the Bible in Greek and Hebrew, Williams had arrived in America from England with his new wife in February of 1631. He was an ordained Anglican minister, and at that time he came to America, he still held infant baptism. While living in Plymouth, Williams preached to the native Indians. He learned their language and made many friends among them, including two of their chiefs. He was a great statesman. Roger Williams was. Very kind man, a great statesman. In, in, in August 1634, he was appointed the pastor of the Anglican congregation in Salem, but on October 9th, 1635, he was banished from the colony for preaching new and dangerous opinions. He was given six weeks to leave, and in January, he was forced into the wilderness in the midst of a brutal New England winter. That's cold, isn't it? The Indians helped him, and in June, he traveled. The Indians helped him. How about that? Yeah, you'll, you'll find in history, Baptists were very good friends to Indians in America. We're going to talk about a man named Isaac McCoy. I've got about six books back there of them that, that nobody knows about Isaac McCoy. You know about David Brainerd, right? You know about all these other guys. You know about David Livingston. You know that song everybody likes to sing, Bury My Heart in the Mission Field, isn't it? Yeah, you know that. You know that one. Everybody, everybody that does a missionary video, you don't know that. You didn't come from Fundyville. Sorry. We come from Fundyville. We know the song. Everybody has the same look on their face, and there's always a starving kid, half naked. Anyway, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> just, you had to be there. <laughs> anyway, you know about them, but you don't know about Isaac McCoy. Why don't you know who Isaac McCoy is? Why don't you know the man that did more for American Indians than any man in history? And nobody knows who he is. Nobody knows who he is. Sad, sad, sad. You're going to know, though, because we're going to talk about him. And boy, is there a lot to talk about. But I have to study up on him. There's a ton to talk about. But anyway, but on October 9, 1635, he was banished from the colony, right? So that's Roger Williams. Roger Williams made friends with the Indians. They liked him. They helped him. The Indians helped him. And in June, he traveled by canoe up a river to Rhode Island and established a settlement of Providence. Others joined him from Massachusetts. And this place became a bastion of religious liberty. Not Massachusetts. They are still commies. Nothing's changed in Massachusetts. Boston, they're a bunch of commies. They just are. There's still a bunch of devils. Nothing's changed in Massachusetts. They're wicked as hell there. They're still wicked as hell there. Ooh, their laws are awful. Horrible laws. Anyway, I don't know why anybody lives there. I cannot figure out why anybody would live there. So most people live in New Hampshire and drive to Massachusetts. That's what they do. A lot of them. I don't blame him. I probably would, too. Anyway, others joined him from Massachusetts, and this place became the bastion of religious liberty. Their stated purpose was to hold forth a lively experiment. I love that. That a, that a f most flourishing civil state may stand and, be, and best be maintained with full liberty and religious concernments. And it was. It was a lively experiment, and it was the first free government ever. In March 1639, Roger Williams was publicly immersed in baptism and the First Baptist Church of Rhode Island. Well, that's not true. John Clark started the First Baptist Church of Rhode Island, but there's always a disagreement about that. But I uh, see Josh Davenport's book, The Vindication of the First Baptist Church of Rhode Island, which John Clark was the founder. In March 1644, Williams obtained a charter from the King of England to establish Rhode Island. It's interesting to me that... that um, and because most people don't know about John Clark, that's the problem. Anyway, Williams wrote a book against the Anglicans, and it was called A Bloody Tenet of Persecution for the Cause of Conscience, in which he boldly defended the liberty of conscience. Those slanders have been heaped upon Roger Williams by various historians. Many learned Baptist writers as well, and others have set the record straight. See the histories of Thomas Armitage and David Benedict. They both lay it straight, because... The reply from, what was his name? What's that devil's name? Yeah, Cotton Mather, yeah. That guy. His reply was, a bloody tenant washed in the blood of the lamb or something like that. So then Roger Williams wrote another one, and it was a bloody tenant yet more bloody. So they just went back and forth, and they just kept adding the title. The title ended up being like this long when they were done. So it's a big, long title. In 1643, Lady Deborah Moody, who owned a 400-acre farm in the town of Swampscott, was forced to move to Long Island, New York, to live among the Dutch in order to escape persecution in Massachusetts. Her crime was that she denied infant baptism. The first law against the Baptists in America was made in Massachusetts in November of 1644. The law threatened severe punishments against Anabaptists. That year, Thomas Painter was whipped for denying infant baptism. In America, nobody knows that. In February 1640, the, because the Puritans came here for religious liberty. And they were such good people. The, and the, yeah, the, the Puritans were such good, kind people. I mean, Cotton Mather and all, they were such great people. Such a murder and devils. In February 1646, William Witter and John Wood of Lynn were publicly rebuked and fined for denying infant baptism. John Spur was fined in July 1651 for the same crime. In 1651, some Baptists were arrested and one was brutally whipped in Massachusetts. The name of those arrested were John Clark, Obadiah Holmes, and John Crandall. So you know the story. Um, you know, Holmes was beaten with 30 strokes of a three-quartered whip. In a letter to a Baptist church in England, Holmes recounted the Lord's mercy in strengthening him during the trial. He said this, For in truth, as the strokes fell upon my back, I had such a spiritual manifestation of God's presence, and the like thereof I never had, nor felt, nor can with fleshly tongue express, and the outward pain was so removed from me that indeed I am not able to declare it to you. It was so easy to me that I could well bear it, yea, and in the manner felt it not, although it was grievous, as the spectator said, the man striking with all his strength, yea, spitting in his hand, three times as many affirmed with a three-quartered whip giving me therewith 30 strokes 
when he had loosed me from the post, having joyfulness in my heart and cheerfulness in my countenance, as the spectators observed, I told the magistrates, you have struck me as with roses. Though he testified that he did not suffer from the actual beating, he did suffer much from its effects. The beating was so vicious on his back, sides, and stomach that Holmes could not lie down for many days afterwards. About this time, two other Baptists, John Hazel and John Spur, were in prison because they encouraged and comforted Holmes after he was whipped. After the First Baptist Church was finally formed in Massachusetts in about 1656, the members spent most of their time in courts and prisons. They were often fined, and some of them were banished. The pastor of this church, Thomas Gould, was in prison for his faith. When this church later built a meeting house, the civil authorities in 1680 nailed the doors shut and ordered them not to meet. A second Baptist church was not formed in Massachusetts until 1749. That's how evil Massachusetts is. Yeah. Yeah. Evil place. Whew. This was in the town of Sturbridge, and many of the members were imprisoned, fined, and had their property confiscated. Those nice Puritans. I seriously have a book back in my office. It's called The Puritans on Brotherly Love. I haven't read that. Probably never will. The persecution continued. Oh, by, oh, by the way, another Baptist church formed in 1761 in the town of Ashfield was treated in the same manner. Many of the church members had all their land and orchards confiscated. This persecution continued against many other Baptist churches that were established in those days and did not end until Massachusetts became a colony of the United States and formed their state constitution in 1780. I mean, you can read, you know, um, you can read about... Oh, I forgot his name. Isaac Backus has the record of all that. He was there and went through it all. The first settlers to Virginia were mostly from England, and they established Anglican churches. So in, in Virginia, the same persecution went on, okay? Um, on June 4th, 1768, several Baptists were arrested in Spotsylvania and imprisoned. I've been there to Spotsylvania. Among these were John Waller. Lewis, I've been to John Waller's churches, too, by the way. Lewis Craig and James Child. They spent almost six weeks in prison. On December 1770, William Weber and Jonathan Anthony were arrested and, and cast into prison for preaching in Chesterfield, Virginia. Remember, I think we went to that Chesterfield jail. Remember that outside that, Hannah? We went there. Um, they remained in prison until March 1771. Weber was again arrested in August while he was preaching in Middlesex. Also arrested there were John Waller, James Greenwood, Robert Ware, Thomas Wayford, Waller, uh, Greenwood, Ware, and Weber were kept in prison for a month. Thomas Wayford was severely beaten with a whip and carried scars to his grave. They believed in sola scriptura. I would say their doctor is more like sola turda. That's what I would say their doctor is. I have no respect for them, and I don't care if anybody likes it. I really don't. I don't, I don't laud Calvin. If Calvin, yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely don't. In August 1771, James Greenwood and William Lovell were arrested and imprisoned in the country of King and Queen for 16 days, county, excuse me. On March 13, 1774, all the Baptist preachers in Picked away, were arrested, sent to prison. These were John Waller, John Shackelford, and Robert Ware. John Waller was in prison more than anybody, man. That guy went to prison all the time. He just, I mean, he was always in jail. Always. Him and uh, James Ireland, that guy was in jail a lot, too. These persecutions continued until Virginia was brought into the new Union of the United States. In spite of all this, the Baptist churches grew rapidly in Virginia during those days. The first was formed in 1767 and the second in 1769. Within four years, there were about 50 churches. Yeah. So that is, that information I just gave you, I believe, is scarier than Halloween. This is a factual, true history of what took place, what the Reformers did. These are all the children of the Reformers. This is their doctrine. They would have done more to the Baptists in America. If they would have been able to kill them, they would have killed them. They did kill one of them in Rhode Island by throwing the old man in prison, and they were the reason. If you had a court case and somebody tried them in court, they would be found negligent because that old man died three days later after he left the prison. So they would, and under today's laws, they would have been charged for murder for that guy because he had, first of all, they had no reason to put him in prison. Second, because he smiled at something, you put him in prison? Because he, no, actually, he shook the hand of Obadiah Holmes when he was beaten. He didn't even say anything. He just shook his hand. So they threw the old man in prison. He died a couple days later or a week later or something when he got out. 
So they murdered him. They sent many of them off without weapons into the wilderness to die. This is their history. This is so, yay, let's celebrate the Reformation. This is what you're celebrating. This is what you're celebrating. There's always been the Lord's church all the way through that were never part of Rome, never tried to reform Rome, but always existed alongside of her. Always. The Bible says that he may receive glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. So there has always been a church throughout all ages. Baptists were not Protestants. They did not derive their existence from the Protestant Reformation. Their tenets have been since the New Testament right there. That's where they come from. That's where their existence comes from. That's what they believed. And that's what they held to. But what's really scary is I bet you you won't hear about that on Reformation Day, except now, because this is going online right away. It's important that you understand this history. It's important that you don't get caught up in a history that's not your own. Know why you're Baptist and understand it. It is important. The doctrines are important. The identification is important. I will never identify with Calvin and his murdering men. Or his reformation. I have no desire to. I know where it comes from, and I know what he did. And I know what all of them did, because they got their doctrine from Rome. They got it from their mama. And they never lost that trait. They still have it today, and if they could do it, they would do it today. They would most certainly do it today if they could get away with it. Most certainly. Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth. Thank you for this history, Lord. Thank you that we can be a part of it. Lord, I just pray that you please would... Use it in the lives of your people, Lord, to strengthen them. They understand the truth about the Protestant Reformation. And the Baptists existed long before. There was always a church. There was always that institution of the local New Testament church. It was always there since Christ died, was buried, and rose again. There's always been a church. There's never been a time, that there never was, that there wasn't a church on this earth. We weren't reformed. We didn't come out of the Protestant Reformation. We existed long before it. They know it. They understand it. They got their manuscripts from those baptized believers. Baptized believers by immersion have been baptized since the Jordan River. Lord, I pray that Baptists would understand their history. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.